I'm Anna Hickey, Associate Editor for Communications, with an episode of Rational Security for January 21st, 2024. For today's episode, the team at Lawfare is cross-posting this week's episode of Rational Security, a podcast hosted by Scott R. Anderson, Quinta Jurassic, and Alan Rosenstein, in which they cover the week's big national security news. Today's episode is entitled The Three Ring Circus. In the episode, Anderson and Jurassic sat down with Molly Reynolds to discuss Ukraine aid currently being debated in Congress, airstrikes by the U.S. and its allies against the Houthi militia following attacks by the Houthis on maritime traffic in the Red Sea, the Iowa caucuses, and more. This is Rational Security. It looks like both of you survived, which I guess appears to be some sort of winter apocalypse by Washington, D.C. standards. A I'm blizzard glad you both of are, 24. The blizzard of 24, all three inches of it. <laughs> three to four inches, I it would say. Four maybe to five. Three. Four to five, and maybe where you are. I, my place, definitely more of a three to four situation. But uh, nonetheless, somehow a complete disaster, mostly of a man-made sort. And I'm not talking about climate change uh, here in our nation's capital. Uh, as we struggle once again to deal with the most basic weather event. It's just insane. I So I don't think D.C. salted the roads. Like everyone just kind of pretended it wasn't going to happen and hoped that it wouldn't happen. And then it did happen. Yeah. I mean, that is in part because this was like the first measurable snowfall we've had in something like two years. Um, Snow drought. And so in the interim, there were plenty of times when we were led to believe that the snowpocalypse was coming. And then there was, in fact, no snow. It is also now just very cold outside for Washington, D.C., uh, much colder than it usually is. It's legit chilly. I do I do like when we finally get the big snow, which is like, which may not happen probably for a while yet, but we're like the whole of D.C. is shut down for like three days. You have to walk everywhere to the snow. That's kind of fun when it happens, like if you're prepped and you're ready to camp out. The first winter that I lived in D.C., I had a very D.C snow experience which was that was the year in like 2015 when there we got like a lot of snow like a lot of snow oh yeah and i was was living in a an an english basement Mm -hmm. uh which means a basement and so our like front window uh which is so above ground it's like half below ground half above ground the front window was like covered up by the snow so we were we were in this kind of like arctic cave it was actually very cozy that uh, that's during that snowstorm. I lived in a moderately sized apartment building with like I don't know, several floors. Um, I lived on the fourth floor, and a bird managed to get inside the building and then had no way to get out. So one morning during that snowstorm, I woke up in the morning and I thought to myself, "Why is there a loud bird noise?" And then we realized there was a bird just like flying up and down the hallway outside our apartment, and understandably when we called building maintenance they were like we will deal with it but first we have to clear the like 18 inches of snow (laughs) off all of the sidewalks outside and so it was it was like 36 hours before they got the bird outside uh the bird was not happy but maybe that bird just didn't know what it was like outside and if it knew it'd be like you know what this is the best of all worlds for everybody i'm gonna hang i'm gonna open the window and invite some bird friends in here because these (laughs) human beings have got it right Uh, what kind of bird uh Bald eagle. (laughs) Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Rational Security. I am one of your co-hosts, Scott R. Anderson. Thrilled to be back here in the virtual studio on account of a snow day of sorts, kind of, although Quinta appears to be in the office, making me feel lazy, uh, with my other regular co-host, Quinta Jurassic. How are you doing, Quinta? I am in the office, although I walked here with little penguin steps on ice, so it may not have been the best decision. Oh, it sounds adorable, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> They'll take it. It was adorable, but slow. Adorable, but slow. That is that is the nature of things during snow days. Uh, and we are thrilled to be here with one of our most favorite guests, Lawfare Senior Editor, Brookings Senior Fellow, Molly Reynolds. Molly, thank you for coming back on Rational Security from your lovely home, it appears. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Um, what you all can see or in the background of my home office is a photo of a place that I only went because Scott Anderson told me to go there on a right. uh, on a trip to uh, to Mostar in the Balkans. So you should all know that uh, that, that is uh, what Scott and Quinta can see right now. 
a beautiful monastery. It's yep. like a Sufi. It was, it's called a monastery, right? Yeah, Sufi it's monastery. Yeah, Dervish Mostar. monastery. Dervish, that's what it was. That, yeah. Uh, again, would not have been on our itinerary had Scott himself uh, not told us that we really needed to stop there. And it's pretty cool. I have yes. to say, it's amazing. I have. I think I am on like the Mostar tourism board street <laughs> team at this point because uh, I've steered so many people to this town between Sarajevo. I think it's on the road between Sarajevo and Split, essentially, uh, in Bosnia. That is amazing. My in-laws are now going there with a whole tour group uh, in a month or two, uh, which I'm very excited about. So Mostar, holler at me. Buy some ad time here on <laughs> Rational Security. <laughs> we are we are here to serve and promote. But until then, until we dip back into our international travel recommendations, uh, we have some national security news to talk about because it has not been a quiet week in spite of the weather plaguing much of the country, including our own backyards. National security news has kept progressing, particularly in the political space, because we've had a couple of big political developments this week. So we are excited to have Molly here for what we are calling the Three Ring Circus Edition in honor of both of our three topics and our three candidates for the presidential election and and other things that come in threes, because all bad things come in threes. And I'm sure we have another one coming down the pike. For our first topic, over the hill, Congress is back in town and up to its old tricks, kicking the can of government funding down the road and still debating a funding package for Ukraine and other Biden administration priorities. As President Biden prepares to meet with congressional leaders at the White House, what are the odds of any sort of functioning legislature in this heated election year? Topic two, rewarm deterrence. After weeks of threats, the United States and its allies finally took military action against the Houthi movement that has been threatening maritime traffic through the Red Sea in purported response to the Israeli military operation in Gaza. But will this predictable approach solve the problem or only invite another cycle of escalation? Topic three, the frozen corn primary. The first step of the 2024 election is officially over, and the race is down to three candidates, with former President Trump having won the Iowa caucuses, the very much frozen over Iowa caucuses, handily, over rivals Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley. What does this first race tell us about the trajectory of the 2024 presidential race, particularly the Republican primary, and how it intersects with Trump's legal travails? For our first topic, Quinta, let me hand it over to you to get us started. So Molly, I feel like my wind up here is something that I could have said at any point over your many uh, appearances on this show, which is once again, negotiations on the Hill are ongoing over additional assistance to Ukraine which is installed by the insistence of Republicans of tying that together with additional border security measures more uh, in a more timely manner. Uh, yesterday, so that's Tuesday, uh, the Senate advanced legislation to keep the government from shutting down until at least early March. And uh, lawmakers are also haggling over a deal reached recently by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Speaker of the House Mike Johnson for longer term government funding so we don't have to keep doing this. Um, So my question to you is, have we made any progress on either of these things, uh, government shutdowns and funding, um, and also Ukraine spending since the last time we had this discussion? Or are we just going in circles? So the answer to that depends on which one of these two things we're talking about. Um, I think on maybe I'll start with the government funding piece, because I think the news there is a little bit better um, for you know folks who care about a uh, functioning federal government. So to sort of rewind to tell folks, remind folks a little bit about how we got here. Uh, last May, then Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy, uh, negotiating with the White House, basically reached an agreement to importantly, raise the debt limit. But also um, in that agreement, they set some overall spending levels for the discretionary side of the federal budget. So that's what funds the Defense Department, scientific research, K-12 education, all those kinds of um, programs. They set some overall spending levels for the next fiscal year as part of that agreement. Within mere weeks of that being signed into law, um, Kevin McCarthy, kind of bolstered by his conference, said, no, we're not going to abide by that agreement. That sort of ongoing drama around um, how much uh, the House was going to allocate in its spending bills, McCarthy's handling of that was one of the the contributing factors to um, his ultimate downfall at the end of September. But... Then we ended up in a place where we got to the beginning of the new fiscal year um, on October 1st. Congress um, had passed a measure to keep the government open through the middle of November, um, but really had not basically re-reached an agreement on how much uh, should be spent in these bills. Like what were the overall, what's the overall size of the pie for defense spending and for non-defense spending for the fiscal year that we're now in the middle of. 
And so there's a lot of kind of back and forth over whether Republicans, principally in the House, were going to get numbers that were more like what they wanted, or if we were going to ultimately stick with the deal that McCarthy and uh, Biden had agreed to. And Eventually, in a couple of weeks ago, sort of just after the first of the year, it was announced that Mike Johnson and Chuck Schumer had agreed that we were going to basically do what they had already agreed to do last year. So uh, we were just going to sort of forget that we had spent another six months haggling about these big overall numbers. And we were just going to stick with the big overall numbers that they had already um, decided we were going to do last year. It took them so long to make that decision that they were going to do what they had already said they were going to do, that they need some more time to actually divide up the pie. So if you think about this as a a decision about how here's how big the non-defense pie is going to be, here's how big the defense pie is going to be, but then how big is the piece that goes to the buying new ships for the Navy? And how big is the piece that goes to NIH? And how big is the piece that goes to Head Start? And so on and so forth. That's what they still have to work out. And so we, um, as of this recording, it looks like they're likely to approve a short-term continuing resolution, temporary bill that'll take us into early March. And hopefully, I'm knocking on my wooden desk, they will use that time productively to actually come to a resolution on um, how to divide up that, that overall pie. Now, would we all have been better off if they had just done this uh, last summer? Yes. This kind of sort of stopgap spending, um, uncertainty about when they're going to, when agencies are going to get full year spending bills. It's a really bad way to run a government. And so uh, it does look like they're, we're going to avoid a shutdown. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that like, this is not, this is not a great way for, um, for all this to operate. Molly, I want to ask you about like the logic of this kick the can down the road strategy and its limits in an election year, a presidential election year, where the political dynamics never not a tense uh, and somewhat mercurial topic around Congress are particularly in a state of flux, particularly important. Optics are particularly important. Everybody's kind of jockeying for every conceivable advantage. There's a lot of pressure not just on presidential candidates, but also their surrogates and also different wings of the party, particularly the Republican Party that is having a competition for the presidency, although not be, be as competitive a one as in prior years. All that together, like what happens as this gets kicked closer to November 2024, right? So this is the second kicking of the can, third kicking of the can, depending on how you start counting that we've seen. We get we get to mid-March. By mid-March, you know, I forget exact when the date of the Super Tuesday is versus this, but it's we will have get close to a resolution of uh, at least who will get the most delegates for the Republican nominee in March around the time that this uh, deal will dissolve. So negotiations will be ongoing against that backdrop of the final few primaries and caucuses before Super Tuesday. And note only also like for Republicans, that's when the winner take all system is allowed to kick back in. So there's many more winner take all states from mid March onward meaning that the race is like kind of designed to come to a close pretty shortly thereafter in terms of delegate count. All that is to say, like, what does that mean for the political dynamics? How does that likely to impact these negotiations? Is it empower people who want to hold out or does it penalize them because people are worried about having a shutdown hurting Republicans generally going into the election in 2024? Yeah, it's a good question. I actually think the effects of all the dynamics that you just laid out related to the presidential election are more consequential for next year's appropriation cycle than they are for the one that they're currently trying to wrap up. I believe that sort of in whatever the next six weeks, so the continuing resolution, um, the stopgap measure is divided into two parts. One part um, for four bills runs out March 1st. The part for the other eight bills runs out March 8th. And so I have no reason to think that they won't just sort of work through this time and get to an agreement on those. There will be lots of sort of kicking and screaming about various things in them. But at present, I don't really see the kind of unfolding presidential race as affecting the negotiations over the current fiscal year that much. What I think is consequential is the fact that it will likely take until early March for Congress to conclude 
work on the spending bills for the fiscal year we're already in will mean that they will get started that much later on the bills for the fiscal year that begins October 1st, 2024. And the longer that work gets pushed off, the more likely it is that that gets wrapped up both timing wise and politics wise in what the presidential election looks like. And this can cut different ways. And so um, I think one really good example of how the results of an election, um, not a presidential election, but the results of the last midterms um, in 2022 really shaped what the spending deal that Congress um, reached at the end of 2022 looked like. So there was this shared sense among folks on both sides of the aisle who kind of really care about making sure that their preferred federal programs are well-funded. Everyone kind of looked ahead and said, Beginning in January 2023, when Republicans control the House, things are going to get really hard and things are going to like there's going to be all kinds of um, of chaos. So we should just do as much as humanly possible in this bill that we're going to pass at the end of 2022. And so most notably, and this is perhaps a good segue back to um, talking about the Ukraine piece of this, that bill at the end of um, 2022 had actually more aid for Ukraine than the Biden administration had requested because congressional champions of assistance to Ukraine, again, like looked around the corner and said, this is not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. It's probably going to get a lot harder. So we want to do as much as we can now. And so who knows what the politics of the next nine months will bring us um, in terms of what people expect to happen in November, both at the presidential level and at the congressional level. Both chambers are, um, I think, up for grabs majority wise. And so as that, as it maybe becomes clearer what might happen, I think that will actually start to affect these negotiations for next year more than it is the ones that are um, that are ongoing. Quinta asked me at the open um, also about the state of um, negotiations over aid to Ukraine. Um, And I think there we more or less are, I don't, I'm going to be honest and say, I don't exactly remember the last time I was on rational security talking about this, but um, if it was basically any time since August, I probably would have said the following, which is that the Republicans have made this choice that they are insisting on linking additional assistance to Ukraine to border policy changes. So when the Biden administration went to Congress in August um, for another round of Ukraine aid, in that package, they asked for additional funding for operations on the southern border, not necessarily for changes to immigration law um, as part of that package, but just more money. By September, it was clear that Republicans were going to insist on there being policy changes. And so basically, we've been in the same place since then. A couple things to say right now, um, as we are recording this, the four congressional party leaders, so um, Johnson, Schumer, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, and Mitch McConnell, are at the White House um, meeting with President Biden on this question of um, aid to Ukraine and the ongoing border negotiations. The Senate has really been trying to drive the truck on on this. Um, There's a set of negotiations being led by Jim Lankford, Republican of Oklahoma, um, Chris Murphy, Democrat of Connecticut, and Kirsten Sinema, undescribable party affiliation from the state of Arizona. And uh, she technically identifies as an independent, though she was last elected as a Democrat and still for the purposes of committee assignments um, is given those by the Democrats, though she says that she doesn't caucus with the Democrats. They have been continuing to have discussions. I think the two kind of most relevant things to think about here are one is Mike Johnson has said that he cannot get anything on immigration through the House that is not um, sort of up to the place that the House Republicans immigration legislation, HR2, that they passed last spring was. So that's um, those are very dramatic changes, very kind of anti-immigrant, very restrictionist uh, policies. And he said that's basically the red line for his conference. Over the last week or so, you've started to see lots of, lots, several Senate Republicans try to prod their House colleagues by saying, look, we will not get a deal as good as might be on the table here if President Trump wins. If President Trump wins, the sort of politics of this issue will kind of 
like repolarize maybe is a way to put it um, back to where things were in the kind of immediate post the early 2017 Trump travel ban, mass protests around immigration, sort of pro-immigrant protests. So that basically Democrats will not be willing to deal on this issue if Trump is president. So if we want changes, we should take what they will what they will give us now. I have no idea if this will work, uh, but that's kind of where we are. And assistance to Ukraine, which is important and consequential, is just kind of, to my mind, sitting there as a potential casualty of this. And it's unclear to me what um, what will happen with that. Do we have a sense like of this big summit? Like this summit is the thing that happens around these big legislative negotiations. The White House says, hey, congressional leaders, come to me. Let's sit down. We'll talk about this. I mean, how much of that is just optics? How much of it is actually, you know, meaningful? Like, does this mean the White House is, has a new pitch they're rolling out or like the outlines of a new idea? Do we have a sense about like how momentous an event this may be? Or is this just Biden signaling, I'm continuing to be engaged on this, even as, frankly, Congress tr- tries to sort itself out? Or do we just not know? Uh, we don't know. I generally tend to think of um, these sorts of things as more like signaling um, and less as like actually um, actually substantive for unlocking an agreement. You have heard, frankly, folks on both sides of the aisle, both Republicans, including Mike Johnson, say if this is going to happen, the Biden White House has to come to the table. Um, And you've heard some Democrats, I think maybe less in Congress itself, but certainly like prominent Democratic voices on the outside who think that Democrats doing something that at least optically speaks to the situation on um, the southern border. And I say that because I'm not an immigration uh, policy expert, but my understanding is that there are, from folks who are, is that there are big questions about kind of what would actually, what difference would the things that are on the table here actually make for the number of migrants who are coming to the United States southern border and attempting to cross into the United States? Like, would it actually make a difference? Um, and there's a, it's not clear as best I can tell. So I tend to think that these kinds of big meetings are more about everyone signaling that they're taking it seriously. Um, and, you know, in the Trump years, these big meetings would happen and Trump would say something bizarre and Nancy Pelosi would say something that people who like Nancy Pelosi got really excited about. And that's what we would talk about. Yes, queen. Yes, exactly. Um, or as I like to say, she would bust out her mother of five voice, um, which as someone with four siblings is a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I don't actually know that this is going to, um, I don't think it's a bad sign for um, the progress of the negotiations, but I don't think it's it, very rarely is this kind of meeting like the magic bullet that unlocks an agreement where one wasn't already in progress. I wanted to ask, speaking of speakers of the House, about how things are going for Mike Johnson, because I, I recall that the last time that we had a big conversation about you know, keeping the government funding on a, a longer time horizon than a few months at a time, that led to some not very good things for one Kevin McCarthy. What is your sense for how Johnson is doing? I, I feel like I have not seen major reporting on his position being in, in danger, although certainly there are persistent grumblings of discontent from the farther right is he in a more secure position than McCarthy? And if so, why? Because it seems like he's doing a lot of the same things. Yeah, so I'll say a couple of things. So um, number one is that, um, so folks may remember or may not, because why would you be paying this much attention to what happens on the floor of the House of Representatives unless someone told you it was your job, which is me. In the run-up to the um, ultimate ouster of McCarthy, there were a series of instances where the Speaker, where McCarthy tried to bring legislation to the floor in the House, and members of his own conference voted down the or voted no on the kind of necessary procedural vote to bring the legislation to the floor. So, in the vocabulary of um, the House of Representatives, this is to say they voted no on what's called the special rule. 
this is really uncommon in the modern house. So these um, these votes, these procedural votes are viewed as things that you vote for for your party, even if you plan on voting against the underlying bill. But like one of your responsibilities as a member of the party is to let the party's priorities come to the floor of the chamber um, and have there be debate and then have there be a vote. And in this Congress, um, some members of the um, Republican conference have started sort of disregarding that norm and voting down these procedural votes. We saw that happen again last week, which was um, sort of an uh, instance that like some of these folks maybe are not happy with um, with Johnson. Um, Ultimately, they sort of moved I don't exactly know how they solved the most proximate problem, but there's like some indication that some of the um, rebellious members of the conference might be willing to use some of the same tactics against against Johnson. But at the end of the day, we've basically reached a point where anything that is going to go through the House that can also pass the Senate is probably just going to do it with a big bipartisan vote. And if you have a big bipartisan coalition for something, you can um, send it to the House floor in a way that avoids that procedural vote that some Republicans had started to vote no on. So again, if to get really weedsy here, this means putting it through under what's called suspension of the rules. So I think, for example, I would expect that when we um, the Senate is moving first on this bill to keep the government open, my expectation is that when it comes to the House, they will use this sort of alternative mechanism that um, avoids having uh, to have that first procedural vote. You do need two thirds, a two thirds majority to move something um, via suspension. But again, if it's a measure to keep the government open for another six weeks, like you'll get that two thirds majority from a combination of um, Democrats and Republicans. And so that's kind of like the world that Mike Johnson is living in right now, which is that There's a lot of things that he's going to have to just go to Democrats that are of importance that he's going to have to go to Democrats um, to get done. And so to answer your last question, Quinta, about like, why is he on a different footing than um, than McCarthy? I think one is that he sort of recognizes and his team recognizes and everyone recognizes that they're just not going to get a whole lot of things that require a party line vote um, through the House, in part because at least temporarily, the size of the House Republican majority is dwindling. There have been, they expelled George Santos. There are, there have been a couple of resignations. Steve Scalise is absent for at least another couple of weeks because he um, is undergoing cancer treatment. Hal Rogers was in a car accident, is in the hospital, all kinds of things that mean that their um, their numbers are, are, are down. And so sort of recognizing um, that, I think that's kind of part of why he knows that Everyone sort of knows what the what the math is. And then the other thing is that I don't think anyone ha- on the Republican side of the aisle has an appetite to go through that speaker ouster experience again. None of it. Having a temporary speaker who um, does not, under the interpretations of the rules of the House, have a lot of power, a sort of repeated votes in conference, votes on the floor... All that stuff. I don't think anyone is really interested in revisiting that particular part of 2023. And so I think the my sense, at least, is if they can kind of muddle through, that's the best option available to them, even if there will periodically be kicking and screaming about various things. Poor Kevin. Just bad timing. Fully. Kevin is now just, you know, back in Bakersfield. Um, he resigned from the House at the end of December. Um Reports are he reported for a jury duty in uh, in California. Although we don't know if he was picked. That's true. We don't know if um, we don't know if he got picked. But uh, but yeah, just Kevin is living his best life without having to deal on a daily basis with the most frustrating members of his own conference. I'm just counting the days that he becomes like all former speakers of the house. A lobbyist for the cannabis industry, which seems to be a popular popular choice, at least uh, among certain Republican former speakers. So I've talked mainly about sort of government funding questions in Congress. Um, next thing we're going to talk about has to do with a big foreign policy question. Um, and we'll get to like, there's a congressional piece of this as well. But I want to start by sort of setting the stage. 
on what's been happening in the Red Sea. So last week, um, the US and the UK carried out airstrikes on more than 60 sites controlled by Houthi rebels in retaliation for ongoing attacks by the group on commercial vessels transiting the Red Sea. The Houthis appear to be largely undeterred by these uh, strikes. They launched another set of missiles on Monday, including one that damaged a um, uh, U.S.-owned ship carrying steel from South Korea. Um, Over the past few days, we've also seen Iran, which backs the Houthis, execute missile strikes in both Iraq and Pakistan, which further raises questions of whether we're in for an expanding um, conflict in the region. So, um, Scott, maybe I'll start by just asking you to put this in a little bit of context for our listeners. So the Houthis have said that their aggression um, is in defense of the Palestinian people in Gaza. That's the language that they've used. But this Aggression by the Houthis and the U.S. response to it is only the latest chapter in a long series of events that, as I understand it, more or less dates back to the start of the civil war in Yemen almost 10 years ago. So for those listeners who aren't constantly paying attention to happen- what's happening in that part of the world, can you um, just provide a little context for kind of how we got here? Sure. I mean, yeah, it's worth starting with who the Houthis are and where they kind of come from. They are a, you know, in legal parlance, a a non-state armed group, um, but essentially a political group organization that has religious and cultural overtones in it in Yemen um, that was, has always been, not always, but for for a long time, been a power center in Yemen, uh, you know, one of these different factions and groups that has a fair amount of influence. In late 2014, early 2015, if I'm I have my time correctly, which I believe I do, you know, they started mounting this offensive to take Sana'a that eff- effectively dislodged what was at the time the Hadi government of Yemen that was kind of the recognized government, forced it into exile in Saudi Arabia for a period, and essentially took over Sana'a and a lot of the core institutions of Yemen's government um, for a number of years. This is what triggered the Saudi-led military intervention uh, that was participated in by a number of Gulf countries and a few other allies, I think Egypt, uh, Djibouti, if I recall correctly a few other countries kind of in the region and mostly, uh, however, Gulf countries, UAE and Saudi Arabia, chief among them. That military offensive obviously became increasingly controversial uh, and the United States role in it. The United States did not directly participate. Uh, It has taken airstrikes against the Houthis at least once, I think once or twice in the past 10 years, um, usually because Houthis hurl a rocket at an American ship, whether it's a Navy ship or a shipping vessel, and the Americans respond. But that's been kind of the full extent of direct U.S. engagement. But the United States did provide fueling funds, arms sales, um, some targeting advice, although the exact role in the targeting process was like a little, it's always been a little ambiguous and a little bit of distance from kind of the final targeting decision. But the United States had kind of indirect involvement with the Yemen conflict in various regards that nonetheless proved controversial, both legally and politically, led to a number of votes in Congress as the Yemeni civil war became increasingly unpopular, increasingly controversial, increasing concerns about humanitarian crises that Yemen suffered through several of over the course of that conflict. Winding down that war has been a big priority for really honestly for the very late Trump administration, but uh, in kind of a quiet way and kind of more loudly by the Biden administration, finding ways to get the Saudis to disengage, reach some sort of ceasefire, move towards a political process that's kind of been in play in Yemen for the last two years now. Um, Military operations have have dropped. The Houthis still control a good chunk of the country, still control Sana'a, but uh, other actors and processes are in play. And, you know, Substantially, the Houthis have been a losing influence by a lot of people's counts in this kind of peacetime era. Part of the reason they had so much influence in Yemen during the civil war was because they were the big dog being attacked by outside powers. Uh, so it led to a lot of bandwagoning behind them for people who were worried about a Saudi imposition or the factions aligned with Saudi Arabia. You know, it also provided a strong incentive to Iran to provide arms and capabilities to the Houthis. That hasn't dropped off so much uh, by most accounts, despite UN arms embargoes and other measures um, during this peacetime period. But maybe, you know, some of the focus of Iranian efforts has shifted to Iran-backed militias in Iraq and other potential priorities in the region because there's no active conflict with Saudi Arabia. And that kind of leads to leads to the challenge of this particular moment. The Houthis are threatening Red Sea traffic uh, in a way that we haven't really seen since the Somalia piracy crisis of like the 2000s. That, uh, and, and this is a much bigger scale. The Houthis are much better armed, much better organized, much better trained. They really are a paramilitary 
emphasis on military organization using advanced ta tactic and weaponry of a sort that you usually only associate with nation states. Um, that makes it much more dangerous and much more effective uh, in a variety of ways. I mean, a lot of the attacks we're seeing on vessels in the Red Sea now aren't what was the case with the Somalia crisis, where you had like small groups of, of guys with small arms on motorboats chasing down and boarding, you know, vessels and holding them hostage, essentially, you actually see, you know, drones and rockets being fired or in one or two high profile cases, like helicopters full of mass commandos landing and doing a maritime landing on the deck of ships and taking them control of them. You know, it, it's pretty sophisticated stuff. The United States has been warning along with a number of allies as part of Operation Prosperity Guardian, the kind of awkwardly named uh, military operation that it's United an States amazing is name. Like, it's an amazing I... name if, if if you appreciate absurd, <laughs> absurdly ironic names. <laughs> I mean, I certainly, I certainly do. But yeah, I mean, it's a little, to me, it's like pretty on the nose about what what is the point here. It sounds like a dragon hoarding a pile of gold to me. Yeah, it's very Smaug. I agree. It's, it's very <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch uh, on this particular one. If you're the voice of Operation Prosperity Guardian, I won't, I won't disagree with you on that one. And that actually is like, a core part of the criticism that the name unfortunately leans into essentially is that the Houthis say we're doing all of this because of Gaza and the plight of the Palestinians in the Gaza conflict uh, and Israeli military operation there. There's almost no direct relationship between a lot of the targets of these efforts and Israel. You know, there may be some incidental shipping that has to do with Israel that's being targeted amidst other entities that are being targeted, but no sort of direct relationship. Insofar as you can say, well, here's with the Houthis probably mean that if you try and make some sense out of it, you know, they are targeting global commerce that supports the United States and Western powers that in turn support Israel. And so it's a tying of the whole global capitalism system um, to the Gaza conflict in a very kind of like metacritical way that speaks to certain global audiences, but doesn't have the sort of direct connection that that many others expect in certainly the nation state level. And that has real consequences. I mean, many, many economies around the world will suffer from a shutdown of Red Sea um, traffic. It's not just the developed Western economies. It is all sorts of economies um, in all sorts of corners of the world. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it is a is a threat to all entities that rely on global capitalism, global trade through this part of the world. All that's to say, the reason the Houthis seem to be doing it is because it boosts them domestically in substantial part, or at least this is one major motivator. The Houthis, again, have lost a little bit of sway, a little bit of influence domestically because they no longer have an enemy they're fighting, and now they have an enemy to fight again. And so a suspicion among a lot of Yemen experts is that they're going to be really hard to deter because the United States and allies can hit them and hit them in a variety of ways but is probably never going to be able to launch a campaign with the sort of intensity that the Saudis did that really did not prove effective at dislodging the Houthis in a serious way. Um, and that the Houthis may be willing and probably are willing to suffer at least the kind of occasional hits and targeting operations by the United States and its allies, because in the end, its benefits it's deriving from it are political, not its operational capabilities against this Red Sea shipping, which is just kind of a an incidental victim of its political goals. It's a convenient target. I think those are. I think there's a lot of logic behind that, and I buy. And I'm not a Yemen expert, uh, although I've worked on Yemen policy in the past. And I, I but I buy that um, logic. I think it is to some extent can be overstated a little bit, though. I mean, a lot of what the United States and allies are, are trying to accomplish here is to degrade the operational capabilities of the Houthis to do stuff like this until you get a political solution to Gaza, or until you can wind down military operations there, bring the heat down in the region, do a bunch of other things that may yet alleviate um, the kind of the uh, surrounding conditions that are facilitating this. And in particular, the heightened tension with Iran, which has been very actively facilitating different proxies, taking different sorts of military action provocatively around the region in response to Gaza. Like they're not shy about that. It's happening with Iranian proxies throughout the region. So if you can wind down Gaza, maybe that cools the relationship with Iran, and encourage them to cool the Houthis. So you're kind of just buying time and lowering the damage the Houthis can do while you have that extended window. And that there may be some moral strategic logic behind what's happening here, but it's not a full solution. It is just a a a kind of a stalling technique or a harm mitigation technique to these sorts of attacks that have deeper political causes both within Yemen and in the broader region. Yeah. So one of the things you talked about there, Scott, is the degree to which the Houthis are um being motivated by sort of their own domestic political concerns. I want to talk now a little bit about sort of 
the U.S. domestic politics of um, what's happening, because I think they're kind of interesting. Um, So we have seen both opposition to what um, the Biden administration is doing from what I'll shorthand as progressive Democrats. We have seen uh, Republicans say, what took you so long? Basically say, you know, the uh, Biden administration should have done this sort of thing against the Houthis as soon as they started mounting um, attacks. And then we also know, and you mentioned this kind of in your your intro answer, that the US, the domestic politics in Congress of the Saudi support for the war in Yemen um, themselves have produced some interesting coalitions. So the um, the sort of opposition to Saudi Arabia's involvement uh, was led in Congress by a coalition that included like Chris Murphy and Mike Lee, who are not often bedfellows. And so this is just all to say that I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that we're starting to see happen in the U.S. on this. Um, Quinta, uh, maybe I'll go to you first. And then, but Scott, when you come in, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the sort of legal questions that are related to the U.S. domestic political concerns. I'll tell listeners that if they want to listen to a much longer explanation from Scott, there's an episode of the Lawfare podcast that um, our colleague Matt Gluck did with Scott and Gregory Johnson, where Scott goes real deep on this. Um, so maybe he'll do the abbreviated version A little version too deep, here. a little too fast. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but, <laughs> a lot um, of stuff's in there. But Quinta, maybe you come in first and then um, we'll do uh, we'll do Scott. Yeah, I'm I'm going to take up the role of Alan and the complaining about the left here, just because I do think that it is worth noting how I think the involvement of the Houthis have, has kind of scrambled and confused, not to put it too harshly, some of the sort of left peace rhetoric in the United States. I've seen a lot of quite frankly, bizarre suggestions of the sort of like, well, you know, the Houthis, they're supporting Palestine, they're supporting Gaza, the enemy of the enemy is my friend. We, of course, you know, opposing US support for Israel, therefore you have to support the Houthis. And I just want to emphasize that this is a, a group whose slogan literally has a curse upon the Jews. Like it's it's in their official slogan. Um, like these are not this is a violent authoritarian movement. <laughs> these are not your friends. The other suggestion is, you know, oh, well, of course, the United States is only getting involved here because, you know, Biden d- wants people to get their Amazon packages on time. Like this is a significant portion of global shipping that's being impacted. It could cause like genuine problems for the global economy, I think it's fair to say, Scott. And so while you can absolutely criticize the U.S. decision making here, and I think that's completely fair, I, I don't have an analysis about whether or not this is sort of the, the right move or what other options there may be. I do think that it is reasonable to say, you know, this is really something that uh, the U.S. and also, you know, the international community more broadly, and you do see... Um, Again, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's been a lot of multilateral support and involvement in uh, U.S. efforts. Um, This is really something that there had to be a response to. The extent to which this is the right response, the extent to which resolving what's going on in Gaza would resolve this, I think are much more difficult and, and tougher questions. But just from where I'm standing strikes me as not particularly controversial to say, you know, something needs to be done, whatever that that something is. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. And, you know, I, I really actually haven't heard that much real meaningful dissent from this idea that something has to be done, although I think people, again, take issue with exactly what from the political left in the United States. You hear it from kind of like the protest left or from people who are, you know, protesting what's happening in Gaza, pro-Palestinian people, um, which is a political movement that is makes very unfortunate decisions and very unfortunate allies all the time, uh, like in part because it's decentralized and it's actually like a bunch of different kind of movements that are focused around a particular issue and cause um, that sometimes get painted with each other, sometimes strategically, sometimes not. Uh, long story short, I wouldn't read too much into that. I mean, I think the main line of criticism you've heard from folks like Ro Khanna, who's like a progressive member of Congress uh, from California in the House, what he and a number of other folks kind of came out and said it is is a common refrain we hear when the president take takes military action like this, which is that the president's supposed to be consulting with Congress and and or getting authorization from Congress before the president does this. Those are both 
you know, interpretations of the Constitution in the latter case and the War Powers Resolution in the former case um, that say th- those steps are supposed to happen. But those are interpretations the executive branch has uh, substantially watered down over the last 50 years of practice, if not longer, since at least the War Powers Resolution was enacted across both political parties, ag- across both branches. Uh, and that a lot, frankly, most of Congress has kind of accepted now at this point, for better or for worse. Um, usually there is not major congressional consultation before relatively limited military operations like this. There's often notification that's sent over like shortly before operation happens. Sometimes there is a degree of consultation or back and forth with senior leaders, but it's limited. It's constrained. It's been like that since shortly after the War Powers Resolution was interpreted. And it's inconsistent a little bit with what the War Powers Resolution says, certainly, but the War Powers Resolution also isn't very precise in what it's demanding, what it requires. So it's hard to say you're in direct contradiction of that. Lack of precision. What, yes, a, exactly. what a concept for the United States Congress. Amazing. And particularly in the War Powers Resolution context, that is that is the whole game. I wrote a whole piece about this in November. I, I encourage folks to look back at it, Lawfare, all about all the ways ambiguities have been used against the War Powers Resolution. Uh, you know, the, In terms of the question of whether the president has the authority to do this, it's a fundamental constitutional question like, you know, does the president or Congress have the authority to take military action like this? But the executive branch has said now through across the last three presidential administrations and, and arguably even longer, the president has the legal authority, at least where Congress doesn't limit it by statute, which Congress has not done, to pursue military action that is in the pursuant to U.S. national interests or reasonably can be construed as being pursuant to U.S. national interests and falls below or where the anticipated nature, scope, and duration, that's a, a buzz term there, uh, falls below what is considered a war for constitutional purposes, another buzz term, basically means it's not a major armed conflict, which the executive branch today acknowledges m- might require congressional authorization. So there's this argument of people have a contrary views. Not everybody has to agree with the executive branch. The Supreme Court has never firmly ruled on this, but the executive branch's rules or interpretations of the law because it controls the military tend to be the operational ones. And while the federal courts have never vindicated them, they've also never ruled against them in the handful of cases where they've been challenged in the courts. So it's none of this is surprising or new. The one tricky issue here that's kind of interesting, at least, uh, that I actually didn't get into the podcast with Greg, uh, which I regret in hindsight, is that there is a problem, more of a problem here, once we get to the 60 to 90 day timeline, which is a a harder and more less ambiguously worded cutoff, although there's still plenty of ambiguity in it, in the War Powers Resolution that says, after 60 to 90 days, when U.S. armed forces are involved in a situation involving hostilities, um, if there's no congressional authorization, you have to withdraw them after 60 to 90 days. What the Biden administration has done and prior administrations have done in the Middle East in the last few years is that they treat each sort of engagement, like each rocket attack on an Iran-backed militia in Iraq or Syria, or in this case, each kind of uh, shooting down of Houthi missiles or targeting of the Houthis as a separate incident with a separate 60 to 90 day clock. That's a little sleight of hand to avoid this sort of time frame and ever actually triggering the idea. They say, we're only planning to take this action. There's no plans for future action. Therefore, there's no 60 to 90 day clock. This operation is over. When we do it, if we have to do a new operation, then a new clock will start. That argument becomes a lot harder to do if you end up with a real tempo of continuing sustained operations. Um, I don't know if there's a sharp cutoff where it's no longer plausible, but people will get less comfortable with it. In the Iraq context in 2014, what we saw is that that led the Obama administration ultimately, when they were beginning military operations against the Islamic State in Iraq and later Syria, to shift their legal argument. They were relying originally on the president's inherent constitutional authority to take military action. And then they said, no, actually, we can do this under the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs statutes, meaning that we now have congressional authorization and therefore we can take this action past the 60 to 90 day cutoff without violating the War Powers Resolution. You can't make that argument with the Houthis. Because the Houthis are not affiliates of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban in any really colorful, meaningful way. You cannot make that argument with them. They're ideologically, religiously, politically, in many other ways, very much contraposed to Islamic State. In fact, you know, we just saw the Islamic State take military action uh, or a terrorist attack against Iran, and Iran's the main factor of the Houthis. That's how they're actively opposed in military fighting each other. So that's a really, really hard case to make here. And so if you do get to that 60, 90 day point and the point where that argument's hard for the Biden administration to keep making, they don't have an easy statutory argument to fall back on. Maybe they do an Obama administration type move in Libya where they say, well, these are all air campaigns. This isn't what the War Pirates Resolution cares about. 60 to 90 days doesn't matter anymore. You may get there. But that's a hard argument to make, too. The Obama administration took a lot of criticism for that, and it got Congress upset. So, you know, 
Congress may get more upset depending on the arguments this has to go to because it may lead the Biden administration to doing things that are more outside the norm of established conduct of the president. So far, we're not there yet, though. This is still the kind of stuff that presidents do do. And that while it's always a little controversial, most people and most members of Congress have more or less accepted it at this point. So there's been kind of a lot of um, discussion about the consequences of these strikes, certainly for global shipping. Um, But I also want to um, ask about the consequences for the prospects of broader conflict in the region, um, especially because we have seen Iran, uh, which, Scott, as you were just talking about, um, is allied with the Houthis um, themselves start to engage in uh, some uh, airstrikes in or missile strikes in um, other parts of the Middle East. So can you just sort of talk us through a little bit about what's going on there? Yeah, it's pretty wild. Like these are actually the most interesting developments that have happened in the last few days. And this happened after the podcast uh, I did with Greg uh, and Matt. So uh, like, it's interesting to dig into a little bit. We saw Iran take two sets of attacks over the weekend, essentially. One in northern Iraq and Erbil on what they said was an Israeli intelligence facility, um, but that local authorities and national authorities in Iraq, the, the, the Erbil is in a, a largely autonomous Kurdish region. So like local and national authorities don't always get along. They seem very united on the, the position that no such thing was happening here. And this was just an attack on a private home that killed a bunch of Iraqi civilians. Uh, and then we saw another attack on its purported sites associated with the Islamic State in Pakistan, which is the group that claimed credit for a terrorist attack uh, a few weeks ago in Iran that killed a number of civilians that were out kind of publicly demonstrating and memorializing the killing of Qasem Soleimani uh, back in 2020 by the Trump administration by a U.S. airstrike. What to make of these is really, really interesting and tricky. Uh, I mean, some Iranian statements have tied the action in Iraq to the Islamic State attack in some ways. That makes very little sense. It's like trying to draw some connection to the Islamic State and Israelis and Americans in Iraq. I think much more realistically is that that was actually a pushback against the United States for their attack on the Houthis and Iran kind of trying to signal, hey, we're willing to escalate in other domains. The United States then recently, just in the last 24 or 48 hours at this point when we're recording, took preemptive action against a number of other Houthi targets, not quite at the same scale as what happened last week, but nonetheless a significant military action. So we may be seeing a little bit of an escalatory cycle here, Um, although both Iran and the United States have tended to go up to the precipice of escalation and then step back. And I kind of expect that to happen here as well, because neither one has an incentive to really kick things off in the region. But, But maybe we're getting closer to that. But it's a pretty notable action here uh, that happened er- in Erbil. On top of that, the, the Pakistan action, much more kind of conventional in that, is, again, this is an Islamic State. But the kicking off of this Iran Islamic State sort of action, I think, is really, really interesting, an interesting chapter um, where, again, regional alliances and military challenges are becoming much more at odds and intersecting in very unconventional ways that are going to be problematic and chaotic as states kind of sort out how to handle them, particularly against a tense backdrop like like Gaza is causing in the region. Well, let us go now for our third topic from the hot politically, climate-wise, and otherwise terrain of the Red Sea to the frigid, frigid, cold cornfields of the state of Iowa, where we have just seen the first step in our process for selecting the people who might be our next president uh, after November 2024 take place. This is, of course, the Republican primary, although not primary, Republican Iowa caucuses, um, where they select and allocate their delegates to the Republican National Convention this summer, who will ultimately select who the Republican nominee for president is. Unsurprisingly to most people, uh, former President Trump emerged victorious with a healthy, healthy margin behind him by 20 plus points or so on both counts were Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, more or less neck and neck. Ron DeSantis muscling out Nikki Haley in the overall vote count, but Nikki Haley claimed being the only one other than Donald Trump to actually claim uh, one of the districts uh, or caucusing. I forget what they call them. They're not called districts. They're called so she, won one, she won one county. One county. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, held by a single vote, if I recall correctly. We are then, of course, poised to get ready to go to New Hampshire, where the projections are on slightly different terrain, um, particularly for Nikki Haley, who's got a little bit of an edge over DeSantis there and is even closing in, according to some polling, uh, getting closer to former President Trump, although not quite uh, surmounting him anytime soon in that race, and then goes on to a number of other states in the primary sequence. Molly, let me turn to you to start on this. What sort of 
lessons to do we or should we draw from this election and how this primary process is intersecting, if at all, with the legal process we see unveiling around former President Trump. A theory, an idea was always that this process, if it's going to hurt former President Trump, it's going to happen when it starts getting more public attention, when the proceedings are happening, when there are actually trials happening. We're not there yet, but we are seeing a Supreme Court argument around at least one aspect of former President Trump's candidacy, other actions taking place. Is there something where the trajectory of the race seems to be headed based off of these early results? Um, are there lessons to be taken away from this? Is it as expected or are there uh, other kind of unexpected things that that begin to show their faces? I just want to say before Molly answers that, Scott, I'm really sorry about your best friend, Nikki Haley, and the sudden I always death never, I always of never Haley the Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It wasn't. It wasn't. It was always New Hampshire. So as for what I think we learned from the Iowa caucus, it gets really cold in Iowa. Like, I, it's not at all clear to me that there's anything that we should take away from what happened in Iowa that says anything about the course of the Republican nominating contest. And uh, I have always been skeptical that anyone was going to be able to mount a credible challenge to Trump in the nominating contest. And I don't think anything that happened in Iowa changes that take for me. I don't know. I suppose um, maybe if he outright loses New Hampshire, that could change things. But then we head next to South Carolina, where I'm, despite the fact that Nikki Haley was the governor of South Carolina, I don't think the state's politics have changed. um, And sort of the valence that she has um, has changed to the point where I don't know that she will do well there. I think on this question, though, of the consequences of Trump's ongoing legal troubles for his standing as a presidential candidate, I personally think that's much more consequential for his standing as a general election candidate as it is for his standing as a primary candidate. I'm not the biggest fan of exit polls for all kinds of reasons, but there's lots of data in uh, the exit polls from Iowa. There's lots of other polling data out there that says that you know people who support Donald Trump are not swayed by the fact that he is multiply on trial for a range of um, charges. And so I think that... I think as the campaign continues to go on and we start to shift more towards talking about the general election, it's much more of an open question um, to me. But I just there's not a lot that I sort of take away from Iowa other than that it's really cold there and that it is still an odd way to start off our process of nominating a presidential candidate. Yeah, I mean, I think, frankly, it's been pretty obvious that... Trump was going to be the nominee for quite a while now. And anyone who thought anything other than that is kidding themselves. Sorry, Scott. Sorry, Nikki Haley. And precisely for the reason that Molly says his hardest core supporters are the people who vote in the primary and they still support him. I will say there's some interesting... I think it's actually technically an entrance poll rather than an exit poll. That that you are correct, Quinta. And as someone who yes. like appreciates a commitment to linguistic precision, <laughs> I do believe that they ask people the questions on their way into the caucus, not on their way out of the caucus. It's because on the way out of the caucus, they're so defeated by having to like cross the room and stand in their little huddles that they just want to go home. So that about three in 10 of caucus goers said that uh, if Trump were convicted of a crime, they wouldn't consider him to be fit for the presidency. So I don't want to put too much weight on that. There's a a good Washington Post piece from Philip Bump that points out that a lot of people in the uh, Republican primary voters said that they didn't consider Trump fit for the presidency in 2016. And those people voted for him anyway. But I do think that it's interesting that among the group of people who are sufficiently hardcore GOP supporters that they were willing to go out and caucus in negative 20 degree weather for a candidate who was almost certainly going to win anyway, that three in 10 of them consider the prospect of a criminal conviction to be serious enough that it might shape the way that they think about Trump as a candidate. I'm not saying that that means he's going to lose, but it does indicate to me that despite 
the what's like weirdly become common wisdom among pundits that the indictments have helped him. I just don't think that that's the case. I don't know how much they hurt him, um, but it seems relatively clear to me that they don't help. I don't know. I Molly, do you think I'm I'm going out over my skis there? No, I think that's probably um, about right. And I, I just think that like the most important part is that part where you started, which is that the kind of person who is really motivated to go caucus in Iowa in a not entirely uncompetitive race, but a pretty uncompetitive race for a candidate is not one who is going to be in our current world persuaded by like the fact that Trump is facing charges. I was also going to ask you, was that an actual negative 20 degrees or was that the wind chill? Because, you know, there's a, there, there are controversial opinions on the topic of the wind chill. Yeah, wind chill hater Ben Wiz. I confess I don't know. It was cold. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> so, um, I mean, let me ask you a little bit about the foregone, the logic behind this idea of Trump as a foregone candidate, right? Um, or the presumptive candidate. I mean, I think nobody, and I certainly have never argued this, uh, and it's true, I haven't, uh, although people will try and paint me as, as having argued otherwise, that it wasn't likely Trump was going to be the candidate. But I think there is a strategic logic to what Haley and DeSantis are doing. And I'm curious what that what this enters into. I mean, maybe we we saw Jonathan last write a piece in the Atlantic saying he thinks Haley is posturing herself to be the vice presidential candidate. I'm not sure I'm persuaded by that. But how do you how do you think she accept in that world? How does she accept the vice presidential nomination from someone who has suggested that she is not a natural born citizen? Like, oh, I agree. Right, under no, Trump's this, argument, she can't she can't serve as the president. To be clear, she oh, is a natural born citizen. Yes. I yeah. again I don't um I don't I don't wanna uh, be accused of um saying anything otherwise. But anyway, Scott, I interrupted you. You should be, get to finish your question. Well, no, I mean my question is like what is what is the logical terrain for I guess really just Haley and DeSantis at this point? We've seen the other candidates drop out, right? Like Ramaswamy dropped out at this point after getting single digit, you know, polling, Asa Hutchinson even lower. Um, they were just kind of the last hangers on. And look, I mean, I think we know what Ramaswamy big motivation is. He is going for national name recognition and kind of boosting himself in the party. I believe former president Trump was on the stage with them, right. When he was announcing that he was dropping out. Uh, and like, you know, clearly he's been in kind of the Trump lane for a long time. He does seem like somebody who's angling for like a vice presidential position or a cabinet nomination or something in a Trump uh, candidacy. Cause he basically was just there on stage to be a Trump defender and pseudo surrogate in, on most issues with like little variances around certain economic issues. Hutchinson was, was a Trump critic, dropped out. Christie's now dropped out. You know, they were there for the stage uh, and it criticized Trump, but ultimately found it less effective. So what do Haley and DeSantis do now? And, and what is the end game for them? DeSantis, worth noting, slipping in the polls, Iowa was kind of his best chance. He did come in second, but pretty slimly to Haley by a much narrower margin than he was polling, if I recall correctly, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the next few primaries that I, sk I skimmed through, New Hampshire does not look favorable to him. He's lost a lot of ground to Haley there. I think he's also behind Haley in South Carolina and Nevada's all sorts of weird. So I have no idea what's happening in Nevada, like, but it's not super friendly terrain for a while until you get to Florida, uh, his home state, uh, if I recall correctly. So, you know, what's the end game for him? Is it hanging out until then? And who is he, you know, if he falls out, who does that help? And who does he ally himself with? Does he fall out and say, oh no, well, I think I was stronger than Trump, but I can back Trump anyway. Or does he say I'm, I'm an anti-Trump person with Haley and lean into that direction? I mean, what, where does this play out and, and how does the weird position of Trump himself fit into that strategic calculus? So I guess I have a couple things to say. One is that I don't really know um, the answer in part because the strategic challenge for DeSantis and Haley the whole time has been how to appeal to a primary electorate that is still very Trumpy as someone who is not themselves Donald Trump. And so I think like part of why you're asking the question is because their their own answers to like what's the strategic play here have changed over time in terms of sort of why that kind of leads to the question of like why did they get in the race in the first place? And I don't really know the answer to that question. Part of it is almost certainly the, you know, 
what if Donald Trump decided not to run or what if something happened that meant he was not going to run? You know, then you want to be you want to be ready Um, in terms of what do they do? How long do they stay in the race? I mean, for me, one of the biggest lessons from the 2016 Republican presidential primary is actually that. In our current campaign finance age, as long as you have the money, um, there's very little incentive to stop running. And particularly if like part of your reason for running in the first place is to get um, a national platform. And I think there's been much made of DeSantis's financial woes. I know less about the financial state of the Haley campaign. So this is a lot of just we don't really know the answer to your question, Scott, but I think it fundamentally returns to the premise that the Republican primary electorate remains very Trumpy. And so um, trying to assess out strategy conditional on that, I think, can be really hard. I mean, I think another another possibility is just that whatever the optimal strategic calculus is here, Ron DeSantis hasn't figured it out because it doesn't seem like his campaign is particularly good at its job. So I don't know, you know, he was always going to have a pretty steep uphill climb, um, but he stumbled and made sort of weird, dumb mistakes at at pretty much every point. And so it may just be that whatever their plan is, it isn't a particularly good one. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and I mean, I think that is one of these questions to say, have we seen DeSantis's plan kind of falter? I think you have uh, clearly like he doesn't really have a clear path moving forward. So I'm kind of curious how much longer he hangs in, maybe, especially because New Hampshire looks like, again, he's he's in single digits now. If you look at like the 538 polls, um, which is a little bit embarrassing um, if insofar as he's supposed to be um, the next leader after Haley, um, but being that far behind her, who's now in the 30s um, with Trump in the 40s is, is going to be a, a tough hill to overcome whatever your goal is, whether it's national fundraising or platforming and identity or identification. So I'm curious how much longer he stays in the race. Uh, and then, you know, Haley is the last candidate there who has, you know, some some logic or incentive. The question is just how far that logic runs. I mean, I think if she had shown a lot more momentum in Iowa, that was always part of kind of if she saw a track towards the presidency, it was to get a big positive media bump off of Iowa, off of New Hampshire. N- coming in third in Iowa really means she didn't get that big bounce uh, or the push. Maybe New Hampshire win or close to a win, a close second will do it. But I'm not sure exactly. And then you do go in the South Carolina and other states where she seems a little bit further down. It, it, all in all, you know, it strikes me as I think not coming in, being more competitive in Iowa hurt her kind of strategic logic insofar as there was one. She's always been there to say that I'm the alternative. I mean, that was the path that she was doing that was different to DeSantis. DeSantis was the Trump minus the incompetence slash legal problems. And Haley was the I'm not I'm a Trumpy candidate in certain ways, but not in other ways. She was never really willing to criticize Trump, although she's changing tack on that a little bit as she gets close to New Hampshire. So there is going to be, I think, more of a conscious effort to push, position herself as a alternative on certain fronts, much more of a conventional Republican, particularly around foreign policy stuff. The question is how much leeway you have there. I, you know, I will note, though, and this is something we talked about on a prior podcast I looked into, and, and it's worth noting, the Republicans have changed their delegate allocation rules this year. So basically, no primary caucus before March 15th is supposed to be pure winner take all. Several states kind of have adopted hybrid systems that have pseudo winner take all rules, but none of them are supposed to be hard winner take all, which was kind of the old way the RNC used to do do things. So that does provide at least some incentive if Haley can be competitive and maybe if the field empties out to keep scooping out what delegates she can until March 15th, where it's winner take all and her chance of getting delegates is much lower. And then again, if you're really holding out, which she always seems to be to me for a Trump collapse of some sort, that's a position where you might have at least delegates in play for a convention fight or alternative at some point. It's all very implausible. It's not going to happen. It's done. Well, but I mean, it's over. I, it's not going to No, 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 but this it's not about what's going to what's it's not about like what's likely to happen or going to happen, but what is what is compelling her to stay in the race if she does stay in the race. And I think that's the logic behind what it does. And I'm not sure like again, I'm not sure it is fruitless logic. It doesn't mean it's likely to happen, but I'm not sure that that putting herself in that position as the Trump alternative is bad, but I do wonder if Trump actually ultimately wins and then ultimately can't be on the ballot or dies or does something else, 
you know, who is the person who's going to inherit that mantle? Are they going to turn to a non-Trump candidate or somebody who's more like Trump? I don't know if you all have thoughts on that. Like that strikes me as the weak point in the plan is that if everybody votes for a Trump-like person, why would they turn to the anti-Trump person as the alternative who, who got the second most delegates if it comes to that over the summer? Yeah, man, I, I got to be honest. I just haven't spent any time thinking about this because it's it's like, what if the moon was made of cheese? I don't know. That yeah, could be I interesting. Say that, I say this as someone who spends like a non trivial amount of my time thinking about other edge case scenarios. This is not an edge case scenario that I have spent a lot of time thinking about at this point. Well, well, we have a, we I, we will wait and see. We have at least one candidate and a lot of Republican donors still behind her, at least for one more uh, race to see what exactly is going to happen. Uh, so, Scott, I, I I'm going to think... buy you a Haley 2024 T-shirt after her Please. campaign is over, and I'm going to get it up eBay for you. It's just it's uh, again it's it's just saying there's some sort of strategic logic these actors are pursuing and trying to figure out what it is. And I and like maybe it's strictly a bad one, but I'm I like. Again, you're you're dealing with an edge case that there's not a good precedent for. Um, so I think it's interesting to think out. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of our time together today. But this would not be rational security if we did not give you some object lessons to think over in the week to come. Quinta, what do you have to share with us this week? I would like to recommend a novel, which I am only partway through, but I am so far enjoying it. It is by Paul Murray. It's called The Bee Sting. Um, and I believe it was shortlisted for The Booker in 2023. And just a uh, very well written, funny and sad, which I often like sad things to be funny as well, um, just to you know mix it up. Um, and uh, I would describe it as a family saga in contemporary Ireland um, that's sort of built around the financial crisis and the fallout in Ireland from that. Well, for my object lesson this week, I'm making my annual public service announcement that for people who don't watch professional football. The divisional round of the playoffs is this coming weekend. This is traditionally the best weekend of football. So if you don't watch football ever, but you're ever intrigued, it's a great weekend to watch some football. This time, three of the four games I don't think are that interesting because of some wild card upsets and are likely to be a little bit of lopsided. But we are seeing a Bills Chiefs game coming back to the divisional round, a repeat of a match a few years ago, which is the best thing I've ever seen on television that is insane and led me to start making these endorsements in the first place. So worth checking out that game, at least. All the other games hopefully will be interesting, but we'll have to wait and see. But that's not my object lesson. My object lesson uh, is an account that has been bringing me so much joy really for a while now. I was worried somebody had used it as an object lesson before, um, but we've checked the records. We don't think so, but perhaps we missed it. But I will throw it back out there again. And that is the Art But Make It Sports uh, Twitter account and Instagram account. This is an individual who has an incredible knack to take great sports photography and find sometimes eerily, eerie resemblances in different types of art, whether a direct kind of one-to-one -one visual parallel or often like an abstract pattern that somehow still captures the layout of the jersey on the green field uh, that you're seeing in the sports photography. This guy is wildly talented and a weird encyclopedia of both art and sports photography and sports knowledge. And one of the things I didn't realize until recently is that he actually has a sub stack now where he does some interesting writing and newsletters, both about arts and sports, which is somebody who both likes art and sports. Uh, I find quite intriguing uh, and an enjoyable read. Um, so I will, I will throw out an endorsement there to the art, but makes it sports. I think it's art, but sports on Twitter uh, and art, but make it sports on Substack. and check it out uh, as we get into this playoff season. Cause it is just wild and the guy there's somewhere a video of him describing his process and it just sounds crazy to me because he basically says i just think about it and i was like what sort of weird brain do you have that has this encyclopedic database of art and images and can recall them so effectively and so quickly to do this multiple times a day but he's just some sort of weird genius and i i love to see that in action molly what do you have for us this week so I'll just say before I offer my own object lesson that if you visit this uh, Twitter feed that Scott just referred to and you scroll back a little bit, we will find at least one post from the national championship game uh, won by my beloved Michigan Wolverines uh, recently. So I'll start there. But my actual object lesson this week um, is the story of um, – Bob, the Portland, Oregon high school science teacher who found the uh, plug from the Alaska Airlines uh, plane in his backyard. Uh, if you are, if you have not read anything about Bob, I cannot recommend doing so highly enough. The man just 
wrung every uh, every bit out of the experience of finding this piece of an airplane in his backyard. Um, he had uh, members of the National Transportation Safety Board come to his high school class to talk to his students about what they do. Um, every story in which he's quoted uh, includes several uh, uh, points where he explains the physics of how this thing ended up from an airplane into his uh, yard fully intact. So it is a, it is a delightful story. Um, in a world of not always delightful news. So I commend it to all of you. Well, folks, for better or for worse, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. But remember, Rational Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare. So be sure to visit lawfaremedia.org for our show page with links to past episodes for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors and for information on Lawfare's other phenomenal podcast series, including The Aftermath, now out in season two. While you're at it, be sure to follow us on Twitter at RTL Security and leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. Also, consider signing up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast, among other special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. And we are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Patcha Howell. On behalf of my co-host Quinta and our special guest Molly Reynolds, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we will talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye.